In our gospel reading, our Lord goes up to the top of the mountain. The mountaintop is a place of encounter between God and man, and so it is a place of revelation. That's where Moses received that law from the God of Israel. That's where our Lord gave his sermon, the compendium of his moral teaching, beginning with the Beatitudes. So he goes up to this mountaintop to reveal us some, something to us. He goes there to call his 12 closest followers, the apostles from among the disciples. The reading says that Jesus appointed 12 whom he also named apostles. And here's the revelation of what stays new. He named them apostles for what? That they might be with him and that he might send them forth to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. These are the three elements of the life of discipleship. But notice what it begins with. He appointed 12 that they might be with him. Just simply being with Jesus is the first principle of discipleship. That is, living in a state of grace, free from the old corruption of sin, living according to God's plan, fulfilling God's will in our life in accordance with our vocation. This is what never gets old. It gets hard sometimes. It's hard to keep going sometimes, but it never gets old. Jesus Christ is always alive and new and fresh. Being with him stays alive and new and fresh. This, we might say, is one of the two sides of the Christian life, the life of prayer or of contemplation. Then there's the other side that is the side of action. So the call of all disciples has these two sides of prayer contemplation. Some disciples are called exclusively to that vocation. But also for most of the rest of, almost all the rest, all the rest of us, which is almost all of us, is contemplation and action. Who might say the two sides to discipleship. But the first place has to be the life of prayer. What we do has to come out of being, being with Jesus, coming out of our prayer. The action flows from that. When he went up to the mountain to call those apostles to then send them out on mission, to be with him, but then to send them out on mission. And we see that that mission also in itself is twofold. There are two parts to it. He might send them forth to preach, so preaching the gospel, and to have authority over demons. That is confronting the reality of evil. This is the mission of Jesus, and so it is the mission of his apostles. They were to share in his mission. The apostles are the foundations of the church, and so by extension, it's, it's the mission of the church, and by extension, the mission of all disciples, all members of the body of Christ, share in this mission of proclaiming the gospel and confronting the reality of evil. That is why we are here today, beginning with prayer, being with Jesus in prayer, begging his grace and his help for the protection of the unborn. The foundational right of all rights is the right to life. And we ask for the grace and strength to put this prayer of ours into action. By that kind of witness is how we confront the reality of sin, the reality of evil. The raw ugliness of evil is never so apparent in our land than in this horrendous crime of abortion. So much so that our opponents, our opponents in this debate insist that we turn away and not look at it. They realize that if we did, we would see and acknowledge how ugly and evil it is. They deflect our attention. It's their way of wielding power over the weak and the vulnerable 
and profiting off of them. But this gets old and obsolete. It has done horrendous damage in its wake, but it gets old and obsolete. Yes, we will face greater challenges going forward, but God's truth will not be stifled. Thank you. I want to take this opportunity to thank you for what you do to witness to the truth of the dignity of human life. Some of you I know doing this for some 50 years now. It seems like an uphill struggle the whole way, but I do believe the tide is changing. People are finally looking at the raw evil and ugliness of this horrendous crime. It is old, is becoming obsolete. It has worn thin. We keep our masks on to protect life during this pandemic. But our opponents in this debate, their mask has come off, a mask that reveals the raw evil of the culture of death. Only by God's grace can we live in this state of grace. That is why he had to replace the old covenant with a new one. By the old covenant, the people could not justify themselves. He is the one, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who by his death on the cross puts us in a right relationship with his Father and gives us the grace to live in a state of grace in this new covenant that is eternal. Let us then, my friends, seek always to be with him so that we might do what he does.